Uh, welcome back to the Channel 84 Variety Show. Now, as you can see, I haven't got Rob with me. Instead, I have a fellow ginger bearded friend here. Mark, say hello. This is obviously ginger beard Mark, as you can see by the interview that I put out everywhere saying come and join us. But Mark, tell us, who are you? Who are, I, I, that's a good, that's a philosophical question. That's uh, definitely so. <laughs> we could be here a while answering that. No, um, I'm, I don't know, I'm just a guy from Wolverhampton who uh, likes the fringier side of things and um, the the more un, unusual, not, I don't, that makes it sound like I like like gothic dungeons and stuff, <laughs> like I, I don't mean it like that, like when it comes to art and when it comes to entertainment, I like the fringier side of things. Yeah. And maybe, maybe the path less trodden. Yeah, I don't know, yeah, we'll say that. <laughs> but um, I feel like I'm I'm stumbling over myself now. Trying to, I usually yeah. interview people. I'm not used to being on this. You're end. not the one that's normally being interviewed. No, we'll come no, on no. to that in a minute. But um, <laughs> other than your interview stuff, obviously, what do you produce? Because I came across you a fair few years ago. Now I was trying to work out how many years ago we we kind of first yeah even just started chatting, a and I think that was all through Graham of Jaws nineteen fame. Yeah, and um, yeah, we started chatting on as it was Twitter. Um, I still call it's it Twitter. Twitter. I refuse to go to X. <laughs> um, but yeah, I kind of discovered you through your Sunday Wonders series, which then yeah. became uh, us wandering around Letwith and Wellin. So, uh, what what sort of things do you produce? What so, other things? Yeah, it's like Sunday Wonders was sort of my first stab at doing my own thing. Like I'd uh, I'd help produce some music videos before that, and worked on some little things for other people. But like Sunday Wonders were the first things I did myself. And I suppose in uh, YouTube parlance, they were adventure videos. <laughs> so they were me going to an interesting place, maybe somewhere with a great history, maybe a filming location, which is the one Tom joined me on. We went to the uh, filming locations of the world's end. Yeah, good old Welling Garden City in <laughs> Letworth. And I like the fact there's comments still going on there to this day on that video. Yeah. And I still try... Edgar Wright's retweeted it once, and I still try every year to get him to retweet it. <laughs> yeah, but he, he was quite taken with your video, because you yeah. did the whole Cornetto trilogy, didn't you? Well, I, I never form. did Shaun of the Dead in the end. I never got round to doing Shaun of the Dead, but I'd done Hot Fuzz and... Uh, uh, the World's End, yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe we should do Shaun of the Dead at some point, then. Maybe. I'm sure if it the, could happen. Sunday <laughs> Wonders Revival. I, I, think I, I, th I do think about that a lot. Like, yeah. a, a very occasionally people ask me about Sunday Wonders, and I do think, mm, maybe. Oh, that's fair enough. It's a, as I say, That was my first kind of discovery yeah. of you, and, and just kind of watching your, your day trips or adventures and, and seeing these places, and some of them were just genuinely interesting. And uh, as we were saying, they just weren't something that was common on YouTube. Um so you kind of had your own own platform there of what you wanted to show. Yeah, I'd say in a way there's, there was there was lots of American YouTubers who had that sort of style, but there wasn't very many English people doing it at that point of like, let's go and look at some interesting stuff in, in England, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. There's, it, it, it was more... I guess if you looked at a lot of the places to go, it was always the very common places, always the places that everyone had been to. It was standard tourism locations. Yeah. There was nothing particularly special about them. It's just everyone had done them, so it was probably easy to research, whereas yours were far more less known. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm still, you know, the the few that are still online, I still get corrected about every now and again, where it's like, <laughs> oh, you missed out this detail, or you got this bit wrong. And it's like, well... When I made that in 2015, there wasn't as as much information as about it as there is. You've got to love the internet crowd. You've <laughs> got to love the fact that there will always be someone out there ready to just point their finger and go, "You got that wrong," or but "You didn't I, say enough." I, I worry that if I wasn't making stuff, I'd be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Um, oh, don't be that guy. No, 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 Mark. You can't be. Um, now, other than the Sunday Wonder side of you, yeah. though, you then kind of went into... You did two years with a podcast yeah. uh, where you were doing interviews with people. Now, going from Sunday Wonders, which was 
not common places. You then went to interviewing some really big names. You had Dom Jolly, you had Gail Porter, Stuart Lee, you had Ian Lee, mm -hmm. um, which were just big names. So you went from this this idea of the Sunday Wonders to to interviewing. Why did you change? Well, they, they, it sort of happened naturally in a way where in, it was like in 2017, I think it was. It was whatever year Ian went into uh, I'm a Celebrity. Oh, yes, um, yes. It's been, I'd, been big in the news again, hasn't it? So yeah, it's... I, did, I did my interview with Ian and that was just like, I didn't do interviews at that point. You know, I, I did these little adventure videos, <laughs> but I had done what in hindsight is kind of a mini documentary about like a night at Ian's show at, at, on talk radio. So we'd got, you know, we, we were sort of friendly at that point. And so he was like, oh, anyone that wants to interview me, come and interview me. And I was like, well, I don't do interviews, but I'd like, I'd love another opportunity to come and film with you for an hour. Like that sounds like fun. So I went to uh, the talk radio studios again and just, it was like stupid questions. I was like, I know his favourite band was the Monkeys, and I was like, who's your favourite monkey? And he's like, oh, Mickey Dolan. So I'm like, why don't you marry him? And it, <laughs> it was a very... Yeah. As I was going through your videos earlier, so I think I've probably watched a good 90% of your videos. There's still some that I've either skipped past because I've just missed them, but the Ian Lee one is particularly odd in, in a good way. Yeah. In a good way. <laughs> It's silly. It's it's silly, and there is like unreleased on a hard drive somewhere. I did do like ten serious questions with him that night, but I was just like, ah, no, forget that. Like, just focus on these these silly ones and how and and I had so much fun, like editing the back and forth. Like I'd never done that before of chopping this this guy and this guy and this guy. Yeah, and um, and yeah, so that that sparked something in me. But then it was a full year, so it was like 2018. Um, Robin Ince, who I sort of know, was um, in Wolverhampton, and and uh, I said, "Oh, can I can I do an interview? I I did this interview with Ian. Like, can can I can I do an interview with you?" And so that sort of that is the borderline then, where that has got a couple of silly questions in, I think, or sort of slightly sillier questions. And a few serious ones. But I was going to say, Robin Inch, you can get away with it. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. With him, it's, it's, it, that, that, that's the sort of yeah. person he is. Um, and I feel like, he, again, like he knew me well enough to know, oh, God, this is not just some dickhead. Like, he knows that I'm being silly. Like, Yeah, and uh, you can kind of, you can imagine. I mean, I, I ballsed it up. So before we were doing the podcast, I was... I had another go at doing YouTube, and like we were discussing before, and um, I had a go at doing retro gaming YouTube, and realising how hard it is to get a good video on something that no one has done. Um, there were other things I thought I'd give it a try, and I went up to Blackpool and did the um, arcade festival up there. I can't think of its name now, but it a room full of all the old arcade machines set to free. Absolutely amazing time. And um, I bumped into the bloke from um, the Gadget Show, and I can't think of his name now off the top of my head. And obviously, it's a, I, I just, it's a famous person. He said, yes, so I could interview him. <laughs> and the fact that he had said, right, no, stop. That's a question that everyone asks let's think about something you can ask that isn't something that everyone asks and i'm still to this day i never released that one because i'm just sat there thinking i was such an idiot i said <laughs> such awful things that must have been so embarrassing i can't believe he didn't just say yeah, turn it off we'll we'll call it a day <laughs> yeah um, I, th I think that's that's the preparation though isn't it that you know the, yeah that makes the difference there that i, I think and and but it, as, you know, as silly as it sounds and as obvious as it sounds, it's like, as long as you can learn from things like that, like, that, it's fine. You know what I mean? It's That's fine it. to have an interview that you'd ever release as long as you learnt something for it that you take to the next one. Precisely. I mean, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm interviewing you now, but for, for me, it, it, it helped me kind of walk away and go, you know what, maybe this isn't quite the thing I should be doing. And I'm, I'm glad I did because... Have coming across the podcasting idea and okay maybe we're already very saturated market and uh 
now we've got famous people coming in and just saying there's some money and all look i'm number one this has been much more enjoyable um and i kind of get the idea from the interviews and the interviews that i've watched that you've done as much as you enjoyed sunday wonders there was a lot of um as much as you say you 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 asked the occasional sensible question but also the fun and the silly questions that you had a lot of passion for these interviews when you got them um the gail porter one for example was yeah. was exceptional thank you man yeah i appreciate that that was like my second what i'd call it, second proper one you know i did uh so it was like almost a year again after robin Ince, i did the epic beard men one and my friend rob shot that and it looks beautiful and we had lapel mics on and it feels really nice and professional and then yeah that was like the october i think of like 2019 yeah and then yeah, it's January, uh, I went to London, hired a room at the Soho Theatre and interviewed Gail Porter. And, um, yeah, then the following month, went to Telford and interviewed um, Dom Jolly. And at the end of the interview with Dom Jolly, I go, oh, good luck with your uh, tour. And he goes, what could go wrong? And <laughs> that, was, that was February 2020. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother, <laughs> another subject that... Uh... But, but, but because of what happened then with 2020 is when I switched to doing them on Zoom. And so I, get, I started with like sort of friendly territory. I think I'd, Ian Lee was probably the first one I did on Zoom. And then I did a, started doing them more. And for a long while, really, I did them on, on Zoom, e even when we were allowed to uh, meet yeah. all again. Um. But yeah, again, I, I, I think I learned something from every single one of them. It's like, as as great as it was to get like Gail and Dom, I think that like now, however many years later it is, four, th three, four years later, I think I'd do the, both of those so much better now. You know, <laughs> just because I've learned so much from all the ones I've done in between, you know what I mean? Oh, I mean, I, I know exactly what you mean. The more you do it, the more you learn. Then the more you go back and you look at what you've previously done and go, well, I could have done so much better that I could have done this differently. I could have not done that, for example. So I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, now, for fear that this will obviously get... Well, not that we're monetized on YouTube, but um, one interview I am still the most intrigued in how, how it even came about has to be Cunt in the Gang. Okay. <laughs> um, so... How did that one happen? Before we get on with um, actually the main purpose of this, history, <laughs> how did that one come around? Because that, that, was, that must have been about Christmas time, surely. Well, yeah, it was. It, I, I, as that well, it's there's no really big story to behind that one. It was just like I, um, it, I think we'd both been on. It, it'd been announced the week before we were both on um, Stuart Lee's on the pedestal list. Oh, okay, yeah. I think and I think it was that way around. And and maybe and I think I just used that, so I just emailed him and said, Hey, we're both on um Stuart Lee's pedestal list for this year. Like, um do you do you fancy uh, doing a chat with me? I think That's I amazing. I'm sure it was that way around. Um so yeah, it's as simple as and this is a big thing, and this is advice for anyone who wants to do anything um is ask like mm. you'd be amazed how far just asking will get you sometimes and no like, ask politely and ask respectfully and everything that goes with it and and don't ask for too much yeah, that's okay. the other thing I yeah think. if know you're going to ask the for favor something... goes i think exactly is... start with something small if they're then willing to help more afterwards or they even they they ask that question say is there anything else you need Again, yeah. still be sensible with it, but yeah, or that that politeness and just asking. I'm amazed at how many people have come forward and helped with uh, audio for the Christmas episode, for example. So yeah, I know exactly what you mean on that. One. <laughs> and so I, just, I think that like with lots, you know, there's there's some that are a bit more convoluted, and some obviously people that are harder to get to. Basically, like yeah. someone like Stuart Lee is very hard. To, he's not on social media or anything. Is very hard to get to. So it's like. There are, you know, more complicated ones. But for the most part, even those ones basically boil down to, <coughs> excuse me, basically boil down to ask. Nice. Okay, well, look, I think our audience knows 
who you are now. Has a better idea. Yeah, so I did so, I did interviews up and well, I still do interviews. I'm only on hiatus, guys. I'm only on yeah. hiatus. Well one of the reasons you're on hiatus is obviously this project you're working on. So give us a quick breakdown. What is this Kickstarter about? Now it's been titled on this interview, it's to do with Melt It. Yeah. And we've been banding it around on Twitter, on threads, on Blue Sky, on Discord, that it's to do with Anthony Irvine. So what is this Kickstarter project about? It's this turning this book uh, into a documentary, basically. This is a f- fantastic book that came into my life early this year and has now sort of course changed the course of my life <laughs> for a while. So, uh, yeah, I um, e- oh, f- January, January or February. Uh, I found out that Go Faster Stripe were putting out that book, the book of the Iceman. And um, I'd been fascinated by the Iceman for years. For for a while, I genuinely didn't know if he was real or not. I thought <laughs> I thought he was like a little bit of like comedy folklore that sort of like Simon Munnery and Stuart Lee had made up. See, I, I hadn't heard of him until you put your post up saying, look, we're doing a Kickstarter campaign. Can you help? Can you get some information out there i started doing my digging for it as well and it, it's just it's someone i'd never even heard of but now i've gone and had kind of done that digging and see what he did i kind of i want to know more yes that that's the thing it, it was just straight away there's this unusual nature of what he did i guess starting in the 80s and then looking at more his more recent works as well you then start to kind of dig into it a bit more and um I mean, you you went and did a video with him at his gallery, didn't you? Yeah. So, well, yeah. The, so, um, yeah. So, Go Fast Stripe. I found that Go Fast Stripe were putting that book out, and then um, Rob Ringham, who wrote the book, got in touch with me, and he'd seen my interview with Stuart Lee and my interview with Richard Herring. I think it was a couple of my other ones, and um, and said, "Oh, would you like to interview the Ice Man?" And I was like. Yes, yes, I would. Because, like I say, you know, to me, he was—I knew he was real at this point. But obviously, I, I, I was, I was like, yes, you know. And I, I'd, I think I'd got, yeah, I'd got the book at that point, and I, I'd read through the book, and um, and I was like, oh yes, yes, I need, I, I need this. And it was, it, Tom, it was chaos. <laughs> Go, fellas, knowing how when you say chaos, I can genuinely believe it was. Utter chaos. Well, he fired, so... he, he fired a gun halfway through. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> that's um. That's okay. Know, that just... that's unexpected. <laughs> Give you a rough idea. Um... So w- was he demonstrating what he was doing? Yes, that's, as that's, the that's, part, that's so... part of the Iceman's act. So the Iceman, to explain for people, obviously, I, I I sort of talk about him like people know who he is, but obviously. That's what we're here to do, is tell people who he is. Um, well, and this is what the Kickstarter is about. Very quickly yeah. going back to that before you describe any more. So you are working on a production that's going to take this book to the next level. So you're going to bring the life of Anthony Irvine, a.k.a. the Iceman, onto screens. We're going yeah. to hopefully see him, thanks to Stripe, through some art house cinemas. But ultimately there's going to be this production that people will be able to watch that will go into the history, the life of, and what's going on now yeah is that is that fair yeah so yeah it's a yeah documentary about anthony irvine who who was a performer in the 80s and 90s then disappeared for about 20 years um did a comeback show for stuart lee as part of stuart lee's austerity gig um in the south bank center i think in 2011 and then sort of made odd appearances here and there and then you know was quite hard to uh, get hold of and then I think it was in the like sort of around lockdown I think he sort of uh, reappeared mm-hmm. as a, as an artist and uh, <laughs> yes I know he's an artist but he only paints pictures of the Iceman and the block of ice yeah, so I was going to say, so yeah, first of all, I've, the t- the 2011 comeback, I think I've only only just started to get to that area of the book now, because I I've, I've think he, he was saying about 
how he annoyed a lot of people with looping a specific piece of music yes. for the uh, for the art. And he hadn't even thought about it. He was looping it, and the idea was it was just to be some background music, but to then have an angry man come over and say, can you turn it off? Kind of um, gives you a bit of an idea of, <laughs> of the the man himself. But um, and we, we art... pl- I was playing that on the as we were setting up to do the f- day one of filming. <laughs> I sat playing the loop on my phone. Oh, fantastic! Just to get us in the mood. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting as I think where I started with my my looking into it for this was um, watching your video of you going around the gallery yes. with him. And the thing that struck me about it is um how similar his artwork is, although about just the ice or the ice man himself, um, how similar it is to a, a, I don't know if you've come across, an artist called David Shrigley. Yeah. It, it, very, very similar style. And another person, if you've not heard of, go and look him up. I think the first one I discovered was a book of his called Ants Piss in Your Beer. And it's just, his his work is just phenomenal. But Anthony Irvine's seemed very, very similar. There was a... A, not a darkness, but there, there seemed to be a whole host of different emotions into the, the, the pictures themselves, and not one of them could you pinpoint and say it's the same style as that painting over there yeah. or that one over there. They seem to all be very individual, <laughs> which um, I was quite taken with. I, I, I yeah. can't say I was very taken with it. And when, like I say, when you consider that they're all the same topic as such, the, the, the Iceman and the Block... They're all so massively different. Mm. I mean, like, uh, I've got one in my house and Rob Ringham's got one in his house. And, they again, they're just completely different. Like, I don't know if you'd necessarily look at... Uh, maybe, you know, someone that's really into art would know. But I don't even think you'd look at them and go, oh, yeah, that's the same artist. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. so different. Yeah, uh, I think that's possibly where the difference is with, with Shrigley's work compared to... Um, Anthony Irvine's is that yeah Shrigley you can look at most pictures that he's done and you can say that is David Shrigley yes but you're right in in a lot of the ones that I've seen of the Iceman there's such a varying amount some are are very childlike almost whereas then you've got some that are really quite deep and and a lot going on in them and neither of them look similar so yeah. it, it it's 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 an interesting one um but what what made you take this on board what i know you said that you you, you had the idea that he may be kind of this mythological character did he actually exist yeah um but what made you take that step back when when the book came out and said this is genuinely something i want to do more on if i had the choice it was and obviously which when when you get asked can you do it you jumped for but um what 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 made you want to (laughs) well well there's two things there um i um it was doing the interview with him like spend and spending so like spending only a day or two chopping down 120 minutes worth of footage into 40 minutes worth of footage but i had so much fun doing it honestly i felt so creative putting that together Oh, excuse me. And um, um, then the Googleton Farm video, I went down to Dorset and spent like a, a, a morning with him and filmed that and came back and just ed- wanted to edit it straight away. You know where you're just so excited with something that yes. you can't wait to like get cracking with it. And that's like the Googleton Farm art, um, art Googleton Farm art um, video the audio again and this is a conversation we had off camera earlier but the audio on that's not great but i i could have sent that to rob and got that like so it sounded a bit better but i was but, too excited to edit it it wasn't just that it kind of gave you the idea the the whole raw feeling of the situation as well yeah um well he's because he's, he's wearing a lav mic but he did manage to switch it off in his pocket <laughs> so it's that's it's the camera audio and that's where you can hear me giggling all the way through. and was that the video as well where just all of a sudden you, you change it to monochrome and he's he's saying goodbye to someone so, oh have you had enough have you see you later then <laughs> and then uh, the cuts back in with the music I, I, yes it. again i had so much fun making it but the, it, it really comes across as that so so this that, is... it was after so I'd done those two, loved making them, 
felt like like I say those are the two things and I've done some really cool stuff this year that's not like bagging on anything else I've done this year I've done some really cool interviews this year but it's just like yeah th there's something about Anthony that sort of got me excited and yeah I just I, f I fell madly in love with him like as just oh my god you're I just want to know everything about you and you're like not only do I find you fascinating as a performer, like you're a lovely man. Like yeah, when I spend time with him, I'm just smiling like the whole time. <laughs> but uh, so, where do you think you first came across the Ice Man? Because you say about you thinking was it real or not, but you must have come across that that idea of him to start with. So where about do you think it you came across? It would have that? been uh, Stuart Lee, Richard Herring, Simon Munnery. Kevin Eldon, someone like that from that sort of group, yeah, who would have brought him up in an interview. Oh, you know, when sort of he he he's almost a go-to when it comes to describing unusual nineteen eighties cabaret acts. There's like, oh, you, you know, everyone heard of Mr. Methane, for example. Yes. But then, like, then, you know, the ice... Oh, and there was the bloke who melt the block of ice. Like, they might necessarily know his name or know anything about else about him, but they'd be like, oh, you know... I I, I was watching a documentary recently and uh, about uh, Ian Cognito, the comedian. It's a really, yes, good, yeah. really good documentary. And um, Joe Brand's in that, and there's a clip of her going, there was a man who melted blocks of ice. And it's just like... So he was obviously held in quite high stead then. For, by, for by what certain he did, people, yes, I think. Um, and that kind of leads me then into one of the kind of final questions before we, we go on for too long. Yeah. Um, why should anyone care about him then? I know that, that sounds a really harsh way of saying it, but... Obviously, I'd never heard of him, but now yeah. I've heard of him, and the, the stuff I've seen has made me want to dig more into it. And obviously, I'm reading Melt It now. But why should people actually go out, out there? Why should they fund the Kickstarter to start with? Because yeah. it's likely that they've they've never heard of him, or dependent on the uh, the generation, obviously. They may have vaguely heard of him or remember him from one of the variety shows in the early yeah. 90s, late 80s. Yeah, well, I think I think that's it. I think like if if you immediately go, why would I fund this? I I don't think you're the right sort of person for this. But I think right. if you hear what there was a guy who melted blocks, what, what, well, why, what? I think if you know if you're that type of person, then that's that's exactly why because that's that was my first reaction. That was Rob Ringham's first reaction. You know of where well, you I mean, hear it and you want. You want to understand it. You want to know more about it. If you know, if you hear it and go, well, that's stupid. You, so you're actually, not for us. Very, very briefly, actually, <laughs> we've completely neglected it. Um, and this will be one of those moments that I'll then go back and listen to this and go, oh, we didn't neglect it at all. I'm yeah. just talking out my ass. But we've said he melted blocks of ice, but I don't think we actually said. Basically, in the eighties, he he was doing the pub circuits and then the yeah. the early variety shows and when it was when stand up was, when stand up was cabaret, right? Okay, there wasn't so, yeah. like a stand up night. There'd be like a cabaret night, and like I say, you would get people coming and doing straight stand up, but you would get people doing sketches and people doing fringy stuff. Like I say, like and this, ob obviously a start of a great things. number of comics that are still going today. Yeah, um, but. The Iceman was something that he was a, would you call him a visual performer, I guess? Yeah. And he would bring this ice block on, which he numbered each of them. I understand he's destroyed a lot of the paperwork, so he doesn't really know what each block number was. Yeah. But uh, his his entire thing was talking while trying to melt this block of ice with whatever he had to hand or whatever he'd brought with him. Yeah. Yeah, so he would bring props on stage... Um, a gun, as I mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> uh, like uh, like pyrotechnics, rock salt, de ice. He would have cans of de icer on his head, and yeah, his goal was to melt. I'll show you something actually that kind of represents what he was oh, trying absolutely. to do. Go for it. Um, uh. And this is also kind of a plug for, for the Kickstarter as well, is he would melt blocks of ice 
in order to make this duck, this is the same duck that he's had for however many years, float in water, like the water right, that okay. came from the ice. Because a lot of the time, and again, I think it says it in the books, he said, the ice is going to melt anyway. Yeah. So whether I'm successful or unsuccessful on stage, it's still going to happen. Um, but that was actually, that was one of my, my, my questions was going to be, tell us about the duck. Because so, yeah, I've the- seen the artwork of the duck, I've seen the picture of the duck. And now we know a little bit more about the duck. <laughs> yeah, that's so that's the duck's purpose. And he, then he, he he would do puns. So because the ice, he'd never usually have enough time to melt the ice sufficiently. He would it, the duck would be in dry duck. <laughs> um, a lot yeah, of puns they were involved in his work. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he so he would assemble a bamboo structure mainly bamboo structures with bits of gutter in so that as the block would melt the the water was supposed to trickle down and get to the duck but it never usually got to right, the duck right okay and those of you that do go out and buy the book which yeah. is an absolute well worth read by the way uh there is a lot of photos from from his at so th- there's a couple where it, you can see the ice block suspended above him on on this contraption with the guttering below him and him wearing what almost looked i think it was of the i was only a quick glance earlier but it almost looked like he's in one of those yeah it looks like that's exactly it looks like he's ready to go and collect lava from somewhere (laughs) but he's wearing a welder's mask yeah that's it um check out the youtube video that go this interview will go onto YouTube as well, so you can actually see what what Mark's putting oh, yeah, up sorry, on the screen. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot that this is a. Fun, I'm, I'm so used to doing video. <laughs> Join the club. I completely <laughs> brilliant, brilliant podcast content, except for when you're showing things on screen. But that's that's my fault. I bought multiple props. I can't, you know, I'm a prop guy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. But um, yeah, so 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 yeah. To to cut a long story short, too late for that. Um, Anthony was a performer in the 80s, much loved by comedians like uh, Joe Brand, Mark Thomas, Bill Bailey, even Mike Myers of Austin Powers and Wayne's World fame uh, saw him and really enjoyed him in the in the 80s. And I think that 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 fits with the fact that even to this day, they bring him up at any point they yeah. can to kind of make that that point about things shows you how as I say, in, in regards, the, the sort of regards they held him in. So yeah. he obviously had something that, that managed to get the imagination of others going. I think, and, um, so. and I think that's what, I'm, that, you know, that's what I'm basically, I'm trying to say is like that if a man melting blocks of ice, like yeah. uh, going on stage with a block of ice and to melt with the purpose of melting it to entertain people sounds remotely interesting in you, to you then come on over to our Kickstarter. We've got, like, uh, lots... We've tried to spread out the tiers as much as possible. I, 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 Rob's done uh, Kickstarters before. I'm a, I'm a Kickstarter virgin, so... Um, but we've, you know, there's li- we've done a, a £3 tier, which is what I recommend to anyone who's got a vague interest. And mm-hmm. for three quid, you get signed up to add, like, a special mailing list that me and Rob are going to set up where we're going to send you photos and videos and little updates, you know, a couple of times a month. And so it's like, you know, if you're vaguely interested and you just want to throw three quid at us, like we were busking in the street or something, then I mean, you get these updates. You three know? quid is absolutely nothing, but towards yeah. the project, enough people just putting in three quid alone is going to help you exactly. sail past. Now, I, I checked a couple of hours ago. You were at 700-odd pounds Something like of that, your 1,000-pound yeah. total. You've got 21 backers. Um, you deserve a lot more, but you've got 25 days to go. And I'm yeah. absolutely certain you're going to hit your 1,000 pounds, if not more. I um, hope so. I hope so. No, I, 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 I don't see a reason why you wouldn't, yeah. because there's a giant gap in the market at the moment. Not just uh, on on podcasts, not just on YouTube, but everywhere. I think everyone's pretty much sick of streaming services. They're sick of all the standard things that are coming out. And um, I mean, I was a huge YouTuber. I used to love, I barely watch anything on Netflix or Disney Plus anymore. Most of the stuff I used to watch was, was YouTube yeah. because of the amount of content that was there. But even now, it's becoming thin on the ground because people are just starting to repeat what everyone else has done. So to have something new like this and for it to only cost you kind of three pounds to kind of get involved in it, I think 
that's brilliant value for money. Yeah. I well, you know, it's it's something. It's a passion project, is the thing. It really is because I, I had to explain this to a guy who I don't know if he was being a jerk or not, but he he seemed like a bit of a jerk in a in a Stuart Lee <laughs> right. group the other day when he said, "Oh, a thousand pounds isn't very much money to make a documentary," and it's like, "Yeah, I know, dude. Trust me, I'm very aware of that." <laughs> but it's like, as I pointed out to him, a no one's going to give us, it's not like the BBC or Netflix are going to give us hundreds of thousands of pounds to make a documentary about an obscure 80s cabaret act. That's just not going to happen. It's got to be made by people like me and Rob who are willing who to work to for do free, it. who are doing it because we love doing it. Like the, the vast majority of this money is already planned to cover travel expenses, to pay for our cameraman Graham to fly over from Dublin, Rob lives up in Glasgow, so for him to get trains down to Bournemouth to be with Anthony, it's going on things like that. And it's, yeah. all it's doing is, you know, we could have self-funded this, but it would have taken us a few years. Whereas just to get this little, you know, the kick, literal Kickstarter at the beginning of the project, we think we can plan in a few filming trips and, you know, and get a big bulk of the film done just with the help of like people helping us with the travel expenses, essentially. Because we're all working for free and just because we love it, you know, and we, we want to make something that, you know, that Anthony's going to be proud of. And that's the key thing, isn't it? So there's the, there is a passion project and then there's passion projects. And the fact that you've, you've already said it's not about the money, it's not about what we're doing, we want this to happen. Yeah. Is well, why I think you should succeed because you get people with their passion projects and they'll they'll go on to Kickstarter and they'll straight away go there right ten grand. That's what I want. That's that's what I need to make it happen. They won't think about how can we make it happen at far less. And it sounds like you all have just agreed that this this needs to happen. And if this is the minimum we need, then that's what we're going to do. Yeah. There's there's no over budgeting for it. It's just let's do this whatever happens yeah basically i mean that you know the trailer that the, there's like a little trailer on the kickstarter which is worth and i'm sure tom will link the version Absolutely, that's on. yeah all links are all yeah. of the material can be found in the description of the podcast but, and on the youtube video but the uh the little trailer that i cut together you know the, the the interview footage that you see in there you know graham flew over from dublin anthony came up to the midlands from bournemouth rob came down from um glasgow I rented a, a hall for us to film in. And, you know, that all came out of our pockets. You know, that that's, that yeah. was day one that we, we all paid for ourselves and that was how we were sort of going to proceed. But Rob's done a few Kickstarters in the past for some of his books that have done well. And we thought, oh, why don't we give it a try? But, you know, like I say, we, you know, we don't want, we don't want tons of money. We just sort of need enough to, to help to us. To do it. Yeah, cover trains yeah. and planes and automobiles. <laughs> So I'm, I've got one last question. Okay, no, I'm going to do any, two. You can have as two, many questions as you want, Tom. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm going to do two more questions on this, and then I'm just going to get you to kind of give out all the details that you've got to hand so people know what to do other than going to the description. Um, I guess the first of the two questions has to be, what what has the Iceman thought about all of this? Because obviously he's he's gone from being in the public eye in the 80s to disappearing to back in the public eye again does he is he excited by the idea that he's going to be back in the public eye again is he fairly nonplussed about it how does he feel towards being kind of brought into this documentary he loves it he lo- he well, the fact it. that he's fired a gun in front of you kind of makes <laughs> me think yeah he he, he likes the idea he just, of he's, being he's, a, he's, a, he's an actor he's a performer you know he's a, he, he loves the attention so it's it's for him it's just a big you know, it's one big performance. Really, he gets to, he gets to be in, be centre of attention, and you know, I I know on on our first day, he he really enjoyed everyone's. You know, there's about seven of us there as the crew, and he loved yeah. being the centre of everyone's attention for that day and making us all laugh. Like you could see, he really lit up when we'd all burst out laughing at something he'd say. So yeah, he loves it. He sent he sent me a lovely email today, which you know, I won't read, but I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase of saying he's really excited that this year with the book and now sort of announcing the film towards the end of the year 
like it's great that, that you know this sort of he went away and now he's sort of come back out of nowhere. Oh, you know, he's really excited about it. Oh, no, that that that's just another reason to get this funded then, really, because if he's excited about it, yeah. Um, and everyone that's making it is excited <laughs> about it. it. It just it deserves to be out there. Yeah. Um, but coming before we go any further, then don't, stopping it from getting too long. How how do you think the variety scene would see him now? Because obviously, um, I find it a bit of a, a a bone of contention when you think see things like Britain's Got Talent or America's hey. Got Talent. And to be fair, I, I would say the American side of things maybe not so much, but the Britain's Got Talent side. I just don't see it as variety anymore. It's very much an option to have someone that's either dancing or singing. There doesn't seem to be anyone that's willing to go on there and be different. And um, do you think kind of he'd be popular today? If he, if he just... went on to something like Britain's Got Talent, what what do you think would happen? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't... It's hard to say, isn't it? Because... Those it's, those shows can sometimes be made like edited in a way where where they change it from laughing with somebody to laughing mm. at somebody, and I worry that that do sort th- of format could they could easily do that to someone like Anthony? Be like, oh, look at this confused old man trying to melt ice, isn't he? You know what I mean? I just, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It, it's it kind of opens up kind of how I feel about the whole of that. So, which is. It isn't a variety show anymore, really, is it? It's we we don't have traditional variety in the UK anymore. I guess Not really, really. It's, it's it's something that's, that's disappeared. Which I, I genuinely think it should come back because um, I mean I could talk about this for hours. But <laughs> Saturday night TV, when you you'd sit down with your family and there would be some form of even something like Stars in Your Eyes, for example. Yeah. Where you'd, you'd got someone who you'd think, oh, you could never be that person. And even they come out and they don't look slightly like that person. But they sounded amazing. You you yeah. enjoyed it. I don't think there's that anymore. And I think Anthony Irvine, the Iceman, would fit in much better if we could bring more of that back to the public. Yeah. Um, I, but the thing is, he's not... He just, he's, he's not trying to be... He's not trying to be the ice man anymore you know what i mean he is the ice man and he's not yeah. like he's not like he's um ashamed of it or anything like that or you know what i mean he's very proud of what he did as the ice man he, but he's he, progressed with his work yeah he's though. focusing he's... on his painting now and and so that there's talk of him maybe doing one or two performances and um you know sort of more one-offs maybe just more for us more than anything to film for the documentary but you know he has talked about well you know maybe i'll do one or two more so but yeah i i i think it's more a watch this space sort of yeah uh, I, I think he he wouldn't want to fit in today i think he's you know he wants to fit in in the art world you that's know it's understandable yeah he'd rather be like you know, with next to someone like Stuart Semple or, you know, another sort of Bournemouth artist rather than a, you know, a telly personality these days, I think. I don't, you know, I don't want to talk for him, but no, that's course, the impression no. I get anyway. And that, that's absolutely fair enough. Now, I've kept you talking for long enough. So, first of all, where can people find you, first of all? Um, I'm, I'm just at Gingerbeard Mark, like Instagram, Twitter, at Gingerbeard Mark or... Slash is it slash or is it at Gingerbeard Mark on YouTube now? I think I, you know what I've got no idea what YouTube's doing anymore. I don't know if you need YouTube slash C slash the channel yeah, name or if it's just yeah the I think it is the at symbol now. But um but yeah if, basically gin, if you gin, type in Gingerbeard Mark we will find yeah. you. If you go go type in Gingerbeard Mark in Google and then wade through all the photos of Mark Gatiss with a ginger beard, which is like, <laughs> I don't know if it's a fetish or there's some, there's a thing for Mark Gatiss with a ginger beard. So if you wade through all those pictures, then okay. you'll find my stuff. But yeah, gingerbeardmark.com is a link tree as well. I keep saying I'm going to get a website. I'm never going to get a website. But it's a, <laughs> a link tree that's got the the Kickstarter, the Melt It Instagram, and then all my gubbins underneath. Awesome. So we'll get that posted up in the description. Uh, 
where can people buy Melt It the book? Is that in bookshops at the moment? Is that online it's, only? Um, it, they're trying to get it into independent bookshops at the moment, but if you go to gofasterstripe.com, you can pick up a copy from there. Fantastic. And or then, yeah. oh, you can oh. uh, pick up a signed copy, The Iceman. Well, this, I don't think this is my copy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you can get you can get it signed. Um, by the Iceman as part of the Kickstarter. So, yeah, if if you just want a normal book and, and now, you can go to Go Faster Stripe and get it. But if you want oh, if you want a signed one by the Iceman, go over to our um, Kickstarter and you can pick up a signed copy and help us out, which is you know, the most important. That, that, that's the most important thing then. So yeah. head over to the Kickstarter. If any of this has interested you in the slightest, um, all the links are in the description. They'll also be on Mark's link tree. Yeah. Everything will be linked anyway. Go and find, have a look, dial it up on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's uh, like a PDF copy of the book. There's a physical copy of the book. There's a post signed postcard of Anthony's work. There's um, the print that you've seen and <sighs> this other one. That's uh, Anthony's face. So um, both of them are available. Uh, a T-shirt and then some credits, slight, slightly high. If you want to spend a bit more money, you can get yourself a tidy credit. Um, but it, it, well, either way, it, it's obviously worth doing. If you're looking for something new, something that hasn't been done to death, this is absolutely worth looking into, I think. So... Uh, I think let, let, let's leave it at that. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. I was genuinely really glad you messaged me to say, can we do this? Because I really had fun with this. Yeah. So thank you so much. It's been really and, great um, to catch up as well, Tom. Like, uh, yeah, really, absolutely. Really impressed with what you guys are doing over at uh, Channel 84. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, this will be out on YouTube within a few hours and uh, it'll be in the podcast feed as well in a few hours. So uh, hopefully you'll get some people come your way. Thanks ever so much in advance, guys. Even just for taking the slightest bit of interest. Like, it genuinely means a lot to me, Robert and Anthony. Yeah. And for to all, all, all of the audience that are listening, if you see any of the posts on Twitter, on Threads, on Blue Sky, or whatever you follow us on, please just, even just clicking that retweet will be enough to just get the Kickstarter moving. Um, you don't know if someone you know would actually be interested, yeah. so retweet it get it out there if you can do the three pounds absolutely brilliant if you can do more even better but even just spreading the word be really greatly appreciated at this yeah, point definitely lovely stuff well thank you very much Thanks and uh, so we'll much. stop recording now and uh we'll catch you all next time cheerio